My name is Abe. I'm founder and CTO of Fidesium. We bring risk and research to the industry. So, show of hands, who here has been rugged for three figures? Four figures? Five figures? I mean, right, so there's clearly a problem, right? Now, in 2023, $5.8 billion were lost to a variety of threat events. We've yet to speak to a single person in the industry that tr trades in any conceivable fashion, from retail investors to institutional players that have not been stung by a cyber incident of some description. Now, there's a truism as a result of this, right? That security has lagged behind the rate of growth of the industry as a whole. There's a number of reasons for this. Only 5% of contracts have been audited. Only 1% use monitoring solutions. We bring trust back to the trustless ecosystem. Our assessments are real time, they conduct automated due diligence, and they take a holistic view of risk based on proven actuarial methods. They also act as a historical record. Our assessments are minted on chain as an NFT containing the data relevant to a given assessment to help our customers prove that they're continued good players over time, not just at point of audit. Our assessments are backed with actuarial science, calibrated for accuracy on, on uh, live data, back-tested, and placed immutably on-chain. We also have an API, which we expose to customers, which allows them to ingest actionable security-focused data, loosely fitting into two, into two buckets, uh, traditional cybersecurity fair, simulation, static analysis, fuzzing, and kind of thin OPC risks, right? The AML ecosystem, liquidity distributions, that sort of thing. So our GTM has been and is kind of B2C tooling as top of funnel. We have a host of B2C tools live, a browser extension and a research hub, about 300 monthly active users, and the two B2B solutions we just talked about, the on-chain risk assessments minted as NFTs and the B2B API. So looking under the hood a little bit, uh, how does our algorithm actually work? Well, it's a multivariate analysis that takes a host of different data streams. We ingest of the order of 40 different data sources, many of them on ourselves on chain, some of them through other API providers, and then we aggregate, right? So in this particular case, we're looking at liquidity. Liquidity would break down into percent deposit, burned, locked, how long is locked for, under what contracts. This is actually a much deeper, to, a much deeper tree. It goes, in the case of liquidity, about five layers deep, and the different leaves can interact and influence each other, but this makes for a prettier chart, so tree. So we've been at this for about 18 months now, 17 months, a year and a half. Um, and um, yeah, so we launched our uh, consumer product in June last year. Uh, our first product was a browser extension that protected users at point of use from uh, drainer contracts, you know, malicious signatures, that sort of thing. We then rolled out a, uh, commu a uh, research tool for the community that allowed people to look up uh, tokens with this view on risk. That tool is still live, uh, you can use it. Uh, it's got about 300 monthly active users, but that is not where we make money. We pivoted to B2B um, earlier this year, uh, January. Uh, since then, we have one paying customer who we've recently onboarded. Uh, we have five LOIs from additional projects uh, and an LOI from a wallet for an integration with the API. It's a, I'm not going to delve too deep into this. It's a large market. Roughly $700 billion are projected to be protected by audits um, this year, according to Glassnode. Now, our resident favorite genius, Vitalik, I couldn't really leave this out, tweeted a little while ago that in his view, cybersecurity is the biggest growth area for an industry. We are very, very happy that he agrees with us. There will be a token. Um, early days yet, uh, community incentivization and wisdom of the crowds around security. Uh, we are raising 750K dollars, pre-seed at five mil valuation. Um, EIS, CIS approved, we have a UK entity. Uh, equity with token warrant. Our, co our competitors, ooh, what happened there? Our competitors are primarily traditional audit houses, 
Um, I will have to answer. cut you, sorry. Okay, yes. Can you explain this? Yes, yes. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, so most of our competitors are the traditional audit, audit houses, right? It's a long list, we've put a few on here. I don't know what happened to the styling. I think it was a conversion error. Anyway, you know, Certic, Quill, OpenZapcon, Hacken, there's a bunch of these guys, right? Now, the problem with traditional paper audits is that, well, they incentivize good behavior for a moment. Uh, and there are a number of instances, think of the Merlin hack, right? Uh, where an audit is passed with flying colors and sometime later, something changes. Whether it be a change in a storage slot, an updated proxy contract, the liquidity landscape shifting, or whatever. And the audit is no longer valuable. Yeah, so uh, Chain Patrol, I am unfamiliar with, I'm afraid. Uh, there's obviously solutions like Sherlock, Quill have an automated system as well, uh, SEC3 have one live on Solana. Um, so those are good solutions, right? Uh, no to Bene, it's also quite a long list. Uh, where, a lot of the, where a lot of those focus is on the transaction monitoring space. Um, they act as a oversight vehicle for almost the white tie suited investors in the ecosystem to be able to interact with other players. Um, our angle is slightly different. Uh, we, we help our customers, who are the projects themselves, um, represent their good behavior to their customers to help onboard and build trust. I mean, like my experience with these security audit companies is that usually you pay for the audit and they say usually everything is fine and you will later on find things that are, <laughs> you know, not fine, found in the audits. So like what do you do different from that that like you're confident this automation works and you can generate it on the fly? And secondly, who is behind, the, like who's the team behind it that you are able to build this thing in the first place, right? Good questions. So, um, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come up with a way to phrase this. a lot Give of information. Yeah. No, it's, it's okay, it's okay. It's, they're good questions. So, look, first of all, I just have to acknowledge that by definition, the space that we've chosen to play in, cybersecurity, is an arms race. We aren't going to catch everything. Sometimes we're going to be wrong. That doesn't necessarily mitigate the value of security solutions, right? Uh, now, uh, a lot of the com companies on the previous slide play in kind of the top 3% of the pool. They interact with the big ticket protocols and they charge five, six figure fees. Uh, this creates a long tail vulnerability gap. That's the gap we address by having competitive SaaS based pricing. Um, now, how do we know that we catch things that they don't? Well, the reason we know we catch things that they don't is that we look at things that aren't just based on the smart contracts. We look at things like wallet histories. Where has the deployer wallet been? Where was it funded from? Where have those wallets been? Are there any sibled whales? How is liquidity stored and tracked? We, can, we take a more holistic ecosystem level view than focusing just purely on the smart contract security itself. Although we do also think about the smart contract security itself, obviously. Um, who are we as a team? So I'm the CTO. I've been in tech for 15 years now, uh, varying things in varying places, mostly startups. I led a team at an insurance startup for five years, took them from whiteboard to series A, pricing risks in the drone space. Uh, so that's where kind of the risk analytics and the statistical models come from. Uh, my co-founder is an exited, a second time founder, an exited founder, um, and we have advisors. So Costa has been in the space for years and years and years, was, er, was an early team member of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, Nick, whose name, an employer we cannot share publicly, works for a major crypto exchange. Um, and AVC that we know. Yes, sorry. Uh, we are a SaaS product. Um, good question. Uh, we charge monthly. Uh, there's three listed price points. $299 buys you monthly updates, so monthly remits and reassessments. $799 buys you weekly. $499 buys you daily. Uh, if you want more than that, there is a negotiated product. As yet, nobody has asked for it, right? And that's $299,299, not $2.99. <laughs> just, just, you know, <laughs> uh, to be clear.
Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Natasha. This is Lazar. And we're currently building a tool that will allow people to, people and companies equally to collect and monetize their data. Companies today rely heavily on third-party data. How do we know this? Well, they're willing to pay huge fines rather, to give up, rather than give up access to third-party data. Not only that, but third-party data is becoming less and less available. We're seeing increased privacy concerns, regulatory pressures, but more than anything else, the imminent deprecation of third-party cookies means that companies now need a new way to collect um, data about industry, um, behavior of their customers, and so on. Enter Route 3. It's a tool that uses Web3 and Zero Knowledge technology to allow brands to follow their users around the web, even to places where cookies can go, but not just with consent of their users, but with their intent and in exchange for rewards. This way, brands get more access to more data than ever before, while us as individuals finally get the piece of the cake as well. How do we do this? Going straight to consumers is hard, so we're starting by partnering with brands. In exchange for rewards, they onboard their users onto our extension. They then go on to browse the web the, the way they normally would, and Route 3 collects their anonymized data in the background. At every point in time, the user knows exactly what type of data is being collected and how much that data is worth. While we share this data with the brand for free, because we also get to keep and monetize it, right? Smart. Uh, our main source of income, though, is a B2B SaaS model. We'll be providing services of data management, um, because that's what companies lack, and that's why they can't really um, utilize what they're collecting. We're doing this through data clean rooms. This is by far the most compliant way to share your data and to manage it, but also companies can now uh, monetize their data without selling it by charging admission into these data clean rooms that we build for them. We will also be building and selling data products through various marketplaces as a second revenue stream. We're starting by going through um, brands, but we intend to go direct to consumer, allow people to collect their data, share it with whomever they want, or not share it with anyone, just build it up as an asset which they can leverage in the future and in real life. We have identified two beachheads, one being online retailers, the second one neobanks. Retailers manage multiple brands, giving us access to more customers with less selling. On the other hand, our biggest uh, client right now is the largest neobank in Brazil. Uh, with them, we believe we can build a, a, a case study that will allow us to penetrate this market even further. So our main competitors are companies that do data collection from consumers from all, all over the world, uh, where they just focus on collecting the transaction data, meaning what the consumers have already purchased. We go beyond that and focus on collecting intent-based data as well, meaning what is the customer in the market to buy. A class of data that is four times more valuable than just transaction data. Um, we have, can you? Yes, uh, we know that this plan is very ambitious, but we have already proven to deliver. We have onboarded uh, Nubank as our customer with more than 18 million end consumers and a Web3 data clean room for crypto coin back rewards. We have onboarded in our previous startup more than 130 enterprises in partnership with Polygon to using Web3 technology. And <clears throat> even though this is non-identifiable, no PII data, completely compliant, cybersecurity is still important. And we've proven as managing uh, uh, guys in a, a crypto neobank with more than $5 billion AUM. Uh, this is the team that has onboarded those enterprises to using Web3 technology. They're a team of uh, uh, deep tech, data, and protocol engineers in the Web3 space. Uh, our list of advisors opens up talent pools of top-tier ZK research facilities. And uh, Natasha's background in research psychology and managing more than uh, a couple of million dollars in marketing budgets for companies makes us the perfect team to execute on this idea. We have uh, so far uh, raised 300K from ourselves uh, and uh, uh, we have a healthy business generating almost 50K of MRR. Uh, but in order to accomplish this goal in a timely manner where we expect 20% closure rates, where we expect uh, customer acquisition costs to range from 15 to 25K, 
Uh, and long sales cycles, we need a million dollars of uh, pre-seed investment in order to achieve it. Most of it, as I said, is going towards sales and uh, we have an uh, opportunity for an equity-free uh, co-investment grant from the World Bank, which comes post-money. Thank you. Sir, can you return to the slide that explains how the data goes back to the vendors? Yeah, this is, yeah, this, this, exactly, yes. yeah. So, but basically, we are putting trust that you're uh, anonymizing data, right? Is that, is that verifiable, verifiable that you've anonymized it or? Yes. How? <laughs> you, you got, you're going to have to trust me on this. I'm not giving you the secret sauce. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, whoever was listening to Dan's uh, presentation just earlier, we're using multi-party compute coupled with zero knowledge proof technology to authenticate that the data is, uh, the only certain parts are disclosed, which are not identifiable. We're not talking about pseudo anonymity from the perspective of GDPR. Okay. We're talking about full anonymity. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have proofs that we are not uh, collecting any personally identifiable information. Okay, so what reaches Inditex is basically my age or whatever they're interested about me, but not uh, any identifiable. Uh, yes, yes, this is uh, not data used for targeting. This is data used for insights. Yeah, so yeah. data about cohorts, not individuals. What the brand can do um, in order to maximize the benefits, they can couple this with the existing data they have on their users. They have to disclose it when they're onboarding users throughout three, but technically they could gain more insights if they enriched it with first party data they already collected. But essentially what we're doing is zero party data, so people are giving it intentionally in exchange for something, not just with consent. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I obviously love this. I like, like <laughs> Like, yeah, so the only concern I had, like I had this, I wrote this question on like the same slide, which I'm curious like how you will answer because something I've been talk, thinking about for a while. So like, why would the companies here on the step there integrate this? Like if you go back, go back. So like, why would Intitex Auto Shopee give you this data? Because then they're giving private information which makes their business their business to you. And then you're selling it to their competitors. And that's the, like, that's the hard part. I don't know why would they do it. Uh, the thing is that they get insights, what their customers not do just with their platforms and the cookies where they can track them. They get, uh, for the first time, insights into what their consumers do on their competitors' websites. Yes, but why would I do that? Why would I give to my competitors so, this data? That's two, two You're things. not giving it to your competitors. You are the only one who's getting this data. No, so... Okay. Two things, two things. If a company doesn't want to share their data with us, they can pay for this tier. And that will be priced based on users, the number of users they're onboarding. However, if they do want to share it with us, people are calling data the new oil. Data, unlike oil, can be sold over and over again without it losing value. Also, the way you use it is the, the name of the game. It's not just having access to data, it's what you do with it. Do you enrich it with existing data? This data could be useless to anyone else, Maybe it's just useful to you. So, did you want to? I just wanted to add that uh, the income stream too. The one we, I really, 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 I think we understand the two. Like, mm -hmm. how, how does the two? Work? We are partnering right now with uh, a couple of companies who focus on data marketplaces. They basically price discover data and uh, give database loans to companies. We are placing the data that we've collected, completely anonymized, for sale on this platform for a monthly subscription fee. The way we made our projections here uh, on the next slide is that we're expecting, the, this, is a pessimistic, uh, this is a pessimistic projection where we expect our data, which comes with proofs, to be priced at the same rate as is intent-based data you get today from email receipts and other sources. So this is basically selling anonymized my, my own data, I, don't, yes. I sell it. Exactly. Ah, I see, I see. I exactly. Cool, 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 exactly. Cool. I like it, I like it. Um, like there's this new term, um, retail media. So companies, hugest retailers in the world are actually monetizing your data. And what we want to enable is give smaller retailers a chance to compete as well because now they can collect more data on a smaller number of users. The biggest player in this space is Amazon. That's not their primary income stream, but they are, however, making approximately $300 per person every year just off of your data. Um, that's the motivation for companies. Yeah, they can sell it, but they don't have to. They can just use it internally, in-house, and create a completely new, separate, passive revenue stream. 
So, two questions quickly. Which companies uh, did you refer to? You're partnering up with? Gulp Data and Data Read. Okay. And who would you identify as your direct competitors? Like, you need to pick one. Uh, I would say Measurable AI. They're the biggest competitor. What they're focusing on is they have a lot 15 to 20 spin-off applications focusing on personal budgeting and email, uh, where they are able to give you access to a premium email service, but they collect all your, all your transaction receipts and sell them. Well, thank you for having us on the stage today. Uh, my name is Aileen. I am one, I am one of the co-founders of Basker. Second, second one is sitting right over there. Uh, we named it after a musician you see in this and on the street and venues like this, so it's very convenient that we are presenting on this particular stage today. Uh, to explain the problem, I'm going to tell you a story about a musician we have. So em, em, talented musicians like Emin, when they're starting our, their career, they, need, they have a few limited options. They can either go and knock on a door or a label, meaning they need to give up their 80, 90% of their income for a very long time and getting no royalties from their own music and possibly giving up their creative freedom, which we love to hear from them. Uh, today we're like 50, 57, 55 people in the room and my heart is beating so fast. Emin has 14,000 listens every month, but if he was here, he wouldn't be able to join us for the after party because existing solutions do not offer a fair distribution of income. That's why we come up with Busker. Busker is an alternative music platform for independent musicians to earn more fair and sustainable income from their music. From scarcity, scarcity, scarcity of limited opportunities, market saturation, and financial investment, and speculation, of course, to utility and community. Basker is not a story written by a technology, but it's community. Uh, we are not Spotify, uh, Kickstarter, or Bandcamp. At Basker, our musicians earn what they deserve fairly, not by just their streaming counts, access a sustainable income source with our second-hand market, and receive instant funding and transparent transactions. Our competitive landscape, divided by being the musician-focused and allowing high interactions between fans and, their, and musicians, Basker is differentiating from that platforms by offering advanced analytics solutions to the collectors Allowing, the, allowing musicians to, to create digital experiences and access to a portfolio of industry experts. Uh, how we are make, making money? We love to say busking is free. Every verified musician can come to, the bus, come to Busker and upload their music. And all of us can listen it right now. Uh, we get 10% commission from every transaction happening on the platform. We have our recurring revenue source from the services we are offering. And uh, with the growing community, we're going to have our sponsorship revenue. The global entertainment industry worth trillions of dollars. As fa fans, we are the ones founding the industry. We buy tickets, we buy merch, and United, we are the ones making the beats heard. Uh, Web3 music industry alone worth uh, trillion, trillion dollars, and independent in music industry worth $100 billion, growing every year. Uh, we are a tight-knit team with a passion for music. We've been working together for a couple of years in our venture studio. Uh, we do have a few indie musicians in our team as well. We have our uh, ex... We have in our reservoir, we have ex-CFO uh, of Mubi. And we already graduated from Startup Wise Guys Pro Accelerator program, Hatbat, and Garage Innovation Hub. Our contracts audit approved by Haken. And we got a whooping score of 9.6 out of 10. We currently have 65 musicians from 14 different countries, reaching a fan base of 1.5 billion. Uh, we ask for 300,000 euros to top up our runway budget. We're going to use this budget to execute our go-to-market strategy, secure more partnerships, acquire more musicians, engage with our community, and of course, grow our team. Um, thank you for listening to me. And hopefully you will join our mission to revolutionize the music industry for the better together with you. Thanks. Uh, I have one question regarding the last slide. Um, why do you want to establish a subsidiary in Turkey? I have some limited experience. I know getting paid in 
Yeah, obviously. But I mean, uh, business-wise, and I have some limited experience, and I know Turkey is a bit restrictive about receiving payments in euros or dollars or anything. Really good question. Thank you for it. We actually established Basker in United Kingdom because of Basking okay. culture is way more common here. But in Turkey and Europe and UK have different regulations. And Turkey, uh, not right now, as of right now, but very soon, because we do have to work with a lot of lobbyists in there, they're, um, they're telling us to uh, subsidize there to be compliant with MASAK. So it is a um, regulatory uh, governmental party to prevent anti money laundering and counter-terror funds. So okay. we need to Every country has it, yeah, stay ahead of the game and do it right now. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Can you just explain, uh, like, how is it different from Audios? Because you said, like, mentioned Kickstarter and, uh, like, what is Spotify? But there was on the slide, I saw there was uh, Audios and some other, like, Web3 streaming platforms. So, like, yeah. how is it different from them? Thank you for your question. Well, or, um, sorry, matrices divided by being them, the musician focused and listener focused. Audios is on the right, uh, bottom right quadrant. So, there are, offering streaming, mostly streaming services. Of course, you can buy music and sell it to other people, but they are not offering digital experiences. So you cannot offer uh, different experiences through audios. In Basker, you can. You can also uh, really look up to the people and musician you are you're investing to. So audios and other platforms lack of the solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, what is your actual business model like? Because you have to store the data, I guess that costs some money and you only take 10% of... Oh, you mean the cloud infrastructure for the... Yeah. yeah. So, uploading music is free. If you're a verified musician, if uploading is free. Uh, of course, we're going to need to develop... Our C CTO is right behind you, going to develop some optimi uh, optimization for storing the actual music because it can get huge. Uh, but our business model is when you sell a copy of the music, it doesn't matter if it's the first, first hand sale or second hand market, you get a 10% commission. And we are also offering additional services like analytics feature or Basker Connect, as we call it. Uh, it is a, we, are, we are charging the users by fiat currency, so we do have a recurring revenue from there. And with our community growing, we're going to have sponsorship to our both radio and physical events in the real world. We expect our revenue, uh, we do have a diverse source of income. Uh, NFTs is only a part of it. In the previous years, five, four, five years projects, we are also actually getting our money from recurring revenue and sponsorship deals. And, and you're based in UK, you say? Exactly, yeah. So 300K, yeah. how much runway does that buy you? Uh, 10 months, around 10 months. Okay, and you are f five people? Uh, we are currently four people, but we are all technical founders. I am a software engineer, but a software engineer, our third is software engineer, so we can develop this in-house. Okay. Uh, so we're going to have our legal counsels, we're going to pay to our legal counsels, and smart contract developers, and UX designers. Okay, thank you. Of course, marketing. And so who's doing the business and the marketing? Um, one, of, one of the partners is also uh -huh. in, uh, working on the marketing side. I am, so well, mostly presenting, uh, but yeah. <laughs> So he is an engineer, but also marketing and, and business. For the start, yes, but we're going to expand the team. And after our backend engineer, if we are hiring right away, uh, the next one is going to be the marketing. Okay. Hi, my name is Urosh. I'm a co-founder and CEO at uh, Voriden. And we are unlocking multi-billion dollar uh, business opportunity by targeting dissatisfied World of Warcraft players. Uh, our value proposition is uh, actually creating a blockchain-based economy that truly serves uh, gamers, and we proved that in our test, alpha test. Uh, all MMOs have the same problem. Modern monetization systems uh, directly contradicts with the core values and philosophy of uh, MMO. Also, on the other hand, uh, We've been, we all witnessed like many crypto gaming products that were focused mainly on a fundraising part uh, of uh, the economy instead of actually uh, creating value that blockchain could offer. And unfortunately, that brought uh, many negative, uh, negative perception to web free uh, gaming. But in the past two and a half years building in stealth, uh, we resolved that issue.
it works. Uh, so, uh, Voriden is a classic MMO uh, built, uh, handcrafted. Uh, it is set in epic fantasy world, uh, and it is enhanced by a real life economy backed by blockchain. So, how does it work? Uh, all items are cre created by the community, uh, and instead of having centralized developer shop, uh, gamers own their uh, in-game businesses. Uh, all uh, all tradings uh, are happening in it on a layer two solution. So basically, uh, we are linked to hard currency, and uh, uh, instead of rewarding players uh, in virtual currencies without any real value, we are rewarding people. Uh, in it, and actually it is a great uh, user acquisition and retention mechanics from within the game. Uh, and uh, our community recognized uh, that potential. Uh, and as you can see, we already got the brand of WoW on Web3. Uh, so we open, open up like our, our economy fully, uh, and uh, we need to make money somehow. Uh, uh, the game will, will be free to play, but uh, for involving in the earning part of the economy, a merchant pass is required and a transaction fee on all trades. And if you want to be an uh, in-game vendor, a uh, profession should be minted. Um, the whole economy model uh, actually opens up uh, full potential to one MMO game, uh, and uh, World of Warcraft never had the opportunity to do so. Um, in our alpha test, we had really good metrics. It lasted for two months. Uh, uh, we proved that uh, it rewarding boost uh, extremely retention and organic growth, and also that MMO uh, gamers are willing to spend money and to play for a long time the game. Uh, in the first year, uh, while we are in a testing phase, we plan to generate one million revenue, targeting mainly crypto, uh, X wow players with crypto wallets, and in total, in five years, we, we are aiming for 1.7 billion in revenues, of which 400 million will be returned back to community. Um, we are asking for 3 million equity investment, but as I know, like this is a crypto conference, so we uh, people don't like equity investments. We needed to invent like a new way of investing in our product, uh, and not to issue token and actually cannibalize our economy. So we invented TFR, Token of Future Revenues. So what, the, what does it mean? Our m main uh, revenue engine is our merchant pass. We want to sell to our investor for a discounted price uh, now. And uh, once the, the, game, uh, the gamer buy that from the game, 70% uh, of revenue will go directly to awards and it is written in smart contract. Uh, we are raising one mil in TFR. Uh, in two rounds, where investors can obtain 3.8 and uh, free, 3x uh, return on their investments. We've been working together for like almost 10 years, uh, developed multiple titles with million players. Uh, Voridin is recognized by Hong Kong family office, uh, that it has like the biggest uh, NFT collections, is XE e, e, and Sorer. And we're more than ready to uh, grab this market opportunity. So guys, if you want to talk, do it now. When was the uh, private alpha? When did you do that? Uh, two months ago. So like it last, so we just closed it. Why? Uh, we had a lot of learnings, how to improve it. Content wise, like we, because like we didn't have like any reference on what we actually invented the whole economy. So basically we had like, let's say 80% of our thesis was proven 100% and we missed in 20, so we need like, to fix so that. So which part was proven? Uh, uh, proven is actually that uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, conclusion is that actually uh, MMO gamers uh, want to have their in-game shops because they recognize uh, long-term potential of that. So uh, they, they spend money for obtaining the uh, business in-game in vendors' professions. That's the biggest part that we learned and they started making money selling to other players on the central auction house. That's like the biggest learning. Biggest negative learning is that they're like, let's say pretty smart, so they gamed our economy. For example, like uh, we had auction house, so uh, we had one guild that invested in 
only one, um, uh, let's say, license to have to craft one horse, and they like dump prices within themselves, you know. So like they were selling for 0 0.000 dollars, and we didn't make any money on transaction fees. That's why we introduced merchant uh, merchandise pass. So that's like the biggest learning, and we are going to test that next month. Okay, so here's here's one of the points that. Um, you said in the problem statement that the reason why Web3 games failed because of XYZ. You never mentioned because they make shitty games. So Well, uh, yes and, and no. Yes no, and no. no. Like, uh, I agree with you 100% because my the, background the is... Question, the, the question sorry. goes on. The main, I, like, I just saw a copy of WoW Classic and nothing unique. And it's just an MMORPG with a WoW skin. What makes you think that you can build a, like massively... Uh, multiplayer online game and make it popular. Okay, so like the question is what makes me feel like, uh, yes, of course, our business idea is to target that classic audience, okay, and to enhance the whole economy because that's like our selling no, point. No, no, sorry. It's not Let the... me clarify the question. What makes you think that you can build an MMORPG that is going to be played by humans in mass market? What makes you think that you can build that game? Yes, we already did. Like, we, we built everything, like, from scratch in our C++ engine. So, like, if that's, like, technical question. No, 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 not technical. So, it's not a completely non-technical question. How, like, in order for I, this I, to work, you're going to need millions of users, right? In order to, a business model works. In order for all of this to work, okay. you're going to need to attract millions of users. Actually, no. We, we can do with much, uh, which less amount of... How much? <laughs> how many how many users do you want to attract? The main point, what I'm arguing is you making a popular game. That's it. Yeah, like in a, in a, in a first, you know, this, is like, uh, this is better of you. Like in the first year we can uh, make one meal with 22k. Uh, how are you going to get to the first 200,000 users that you're going to do? Okay, uh, two things. Uh, okay. Uh, this is like MMO uh, fans that covers that. So basically, so KOLs, right? Uh, the first one, the second one, which is actually our core economy part, is actually uh, rewarding players from within. So it's uh, actually user acquisition from within the game. It is uh, in traditional gaming, you need to pay for like ads to spend a bunch of money for that. Uh, in, in our economy, we uh, reward players from within, and this this is like great organic and word of mouth within the community. And also, there is like a big dissatisfaction in the MMO community, and they are seeking this type of MMO. So what you're saying is that you're going to pay the users to play the game, and that's how you're going to attract no, them. No, core game design is designed okay. in a way to reward players. Okay. Organically, so basically, we are allocating our revenues. For example, if you make one mil. We uh, uh, return back 300,000 to players in, as a in game, uh, core game design mechanics. And it's a little bit complex. We could talk about this because, like, we have like. So, so you okay. think it, it's enough to attract like fanatics that are playing World of Warcraft? Because obviously you are targeting that yeah. population. And that is crypto people who will be attracted with the crypto things. Uh, uh, could you I repeat? don't think that most of the WoW players are not in a... Lockdown. We are done on time, so... Alright, so, um, the main thesis is that people as a broader public would actually enjoy and want to help scientists in their research by giving them medical and genome data, but if they trust them, uh, and that's the big issue, because instead of having scientists they trust, they can give the data, they get... Ooh, not working. They get this, which is current state of industry, and there's drug discovery industry and then clinical trial industry, which is not transparent, it's complicated, uh, which ends up that most people simply don't give their medical data because they don't trust this weird thing, or they give it, but they give it broadly, and they just hope that science as, the, as a whole will be fair and will not mistreat their data. And instead, we should have an email or an application pop-up or something that's very easy, very transparent, yeah, this research could be an email. And this is not only on the people side, that people are kind of not really participating, but also scientists have no way to reach to the people behind the data and often end up with unusable data 
provided by big government biobanks, which is just shit and costs half a mil, and startups run out of funding before they get accepted through the bureaucratic process. So, first problem I kind of described, we cannot choose who we support and how. Second problem is actually a much bigger problem, creating all of the downstream effects on the whole industry. Fixed pricing doesn't make sense. In market theory, there is this idea that if one side of a, of a transaction has more insights, then pricing mechanisms are failing. In pharma and clinical trial, both sides have no idea how much this data is worth. Your data can be worth zero or a billion, and we will know in 20 years. So, the consequences of that, clinical trials are expensive as fuck, uh, biobank models just don't work, there's no business model that works. 23andMe is just penny stock, they sold for 300 mil, and what now? They, they have no further business. Solution, we want to make a Kickstarter for science, right? So if you are willing to give your hospital data to your friend who's running interesting research, you're putting your lovely face on a website, you're telling what are you doing, uh, who's sponsoring you, you're very transparent, and you promise him future returns. And then you don't have to pay anything right now, which basically means you can bootstrap in pharma. You can pay me $300, for compute, if you are a kind of scrappy founder on a budget, you can be a student, you don't have to incorporate even. And you can collect a cohort of genomic data and medical data from hospitals that I will get from his hospital. You don't have to re-upload anything. I'll get it from 23andMe, which, why ask, I'm, I'm great, I can help you basically build community and crowdfund, because I did that before. Uh, but why now is because now GDPR allows me to go get your data from hospitals, and hospitals have to give me data in 30 days. That's programmatically accessible. Uh, so we can reuse existing data. So you can literally start a small pharma company on $300. Those are the jurisdictions we can use it. Uh, California as well, but mainly Europe and UK. Uh, some other state in US, whatever, uh, but it's growing. Marketplace, I'm going to skip that, but basically... Uh, <laughs> Important bit is we can target people no one else can target because we can go after students before they even graduate from uni and they can start building company with us and they don't have to pay us more than a credit card that even students are eligible. Um, competition, they suck, I'm going to skip that. Uh, <laughs> uh, total addressable market is gigantic, it's a whole pharma. Uh, the conservative estimate is personalized medicine which is much smaller but still pretty big. And now the business model. So we have the benefits of therapeutics, which is massive returns, with the issue of therapeutics, which is 20 years of waiting for, for massive returns. So how we, do we deal with massive returns? So conservative estimate, I'm really making conservative, but it's still pretty big, is 5% of, um, of personalized medicine, which is much smaller side than the whole pharma that's going to grow to. And we are taking 1% from you giving 1% to the cohort and taking 1% for crowdwas as well. So total 2% charge of future re revenue. And 1% for us is fucking massive, but we have to wait 20 years. So what do we do in the meantime? We have partnership with a company, I cannot pronounce name ever, but basically they are data center for AWS, Google, and Azure, and we are cutting margins from them so we can make pretty reliable 30% margin. And you could say that companies would prefer to run on AWS. Yes, but current biobanks and compliance reasons forbid them anyway. So if you go to UK Biobank already, you have to run in their platform. So basically we have standard, we cut margins from AWS, we have 30% margin, which uh, assuming on existing UK Biobank user base, which is 25,000 people, 5,000 average spend on year, can give us 30 mil almost. Uh, yeah, we are great. We did that, I work at uh, City. Crypto, copper, holding millions, MasterCard, central banks, fiats for the UK government, and, and then it's great for bioinformatics 20 years in Cambridge, yeah. <sighs> Sorry, I was kind of rushing to slides, but I did it. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I think I like it, but I, I, I don't know if I like it, because like it was very fast, but... Can you like explain what's the problem <laughs> in like slow pace and then how do you solve it and why would people invest in it? The problem is there's no data. Even if you, if you currently try to start a clinical trial company or like drug discovery company, you need to raise money. And if you have, even if you have money, there are companies that are doing drug discovery and they're running out of money before they even get any single data file. So how do I get this data? And you said you can start a company for $300? Yeah. 
You could start. You could start doing your validation on compute okay. on a credit card because I'm only charging you cloud bill, which you can be scrappy and cheap, and I'm charging you one percent in the future, right? Okay. So I'm post I'm fixing the pricing mechanism that's failing, because current pricing mechanism is like you have to guess is his data worth billion or zero. Oh, I understand that part. Okay. Which is like, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Look, I mean I know. Yeah. Everybody it, uh, makes difficult questions for me. So what you're saying is that you're going to hack through this current system and hack through the regulations and the GDPR and... There's a way for that, yes. Sorry? There's a way to, to do that. Yes. yes. In order for you to bridge until this becomes fully legal and fully accessible by, by someone. Because... It's, it's already legal. So the, the issue is that... Uh, currently, in, in, G in GDPR jurisdictions, you own your own data. Yeah. If you give me GDPR representative rights, I can go to your hospital and tell them, you have 30 days because this person told me I should get the data mm -hmm. or you'll be fined by the government. And then you can share this data with a researcher, right? So this is already legal. It's the, yeah. the issue is that like, uh, the existing buyer banks, they are not consumer friendly, so people don't really engage. So the GDPR law is not really used. Right? Few startups are starting to consider that. Yeah. And how does the like crypto and blockchain fit into this? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I identity are, I consent for research mainly. Uh, there are companies that are genome IO that are fully on blockchain. I think they are wrong. Uh, Why? <laughs> few reasons. Convincing people to share the data for science is hard enough, and people don't want to put their blockchain data on blockchain. That's one. Uh, and on the buy side, researchers as well they are confused enough, and they are very poor. <laughs> So like if I'm targeting PhD students, I cannot tell them you have to pay for querying each transaction and there's this new system and new IT you have to learn. They don't want to learn Nextflow orchestrating management to do Python scripts better. Like they just, <laughs> they need to have HPC cluster or Linux box, they, they just run their Python scripts. So um, I mean, Genome IO, I think it's just like 5,000 people or something, which is basically all of their investors and friends. And you, yeah, but the, the issue is like 5,000 is pretty shit. Like, uh, UK Biobank has half a million of whole genomes. And how do you, like, okay, so it's two of you. How do you break that from two to 5,000? Yeah, um, I mean, we are two, but I think we, we are enough to basically prove the concept. If, if I can get um, a few researchers who can do this process, and I, I basically, I'm not pr providing them data, I'm providing them tooling and mechanisms yeah. to do their own crowd dating. Uh, great so let's now. say you prove well, that. There's a bunch of scientists tomorrow here on the DSI stage, yes. probably. Anna is one of them. So you have a pitch. So let's say you prove that. So how do you move from like a crazy scientist and a crazy hacker convincing everyone else, you know, in the process? You mean convincing uh, people to participate data or convincing scientists? Both. Both, okay, so. And the investors on the side. Yes, so uh, scientists, uh, we are, I'm going to run a Cambridge Hackathon, Bio Hackathon in October. You're very welcome, follow me and there will be more information. So I don't think scientists will be hard because no one targets people who have no money right now. And I'm going to target people who have no money and before they even incorporate, they will be my clients already with my license. So I'm going for people that no one else is going and I'm just going to sh literally do Bio Hackathons for them. Uh, for participant side, I'm going to be free for non-profit, which is crazy YouTubers. <laughs> yes? Yes? Every investor told me I cannot... No, I know. They told me I cannot use this one because they know it from someone else. Yes. So, but basically, that means I can go after people who are doing random weird substacks, and they can use me as Google Form, but for your genome data. You cannot put your genome data in Google Form. With me, you can. So I'm basically hoping to get critical mass through that. So that's like a, a data side from participants. But also the thing is like with, with, with my model, I'm so early phase, I'm before clinical, starts, uh, clinical trial starts. I don't need as critical mass as big platforms already do. Like the, the cohort can be pretty small and that's enough. Very yeah. cool. Five minutes. I'm sorry, yeah. we're gonna continue later. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Devan and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Valley. In the past, financial advisors had no trustworthy platform where they can manage crypto on behalf of their clients. That led many advisory firms, including the largest Slovenian advisory house, to build their own solutions. However, what they soon realized is that... Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, what they soon realized is that uh, uh, managing such platforms is uh, quite time-consuming and diverts their attention from their core business, which is wealth management. 
We recognized this common challenge across Europe and we decided to do something about it. We built a crypto platform specifically designed for financial advisors. And our goal in the future is not just to stay in crypto, but offer them possibility to invest also in tokenized real world assets. The main problem which financial advisors have is that it's quite time consuming and difficult first to learn about cryptocurrencies and then secondly to construct a crypto portfolio for each client separately. That is why we have built a mobile app through which clients of the financial advisor can easily onboard and authorize the financial advisor to manage their crypto portfolio and also a web platform where the financial advisor can see a list of all his clients and invest not just in individual cryptocurrencies, but also in investment strategies which uh, combine multiple cryptocurrencies. For example, in the traditional finance, uh, financial advisors typically don't do stock picking, but invest in the broader stock market through mutual funds and ETFs. That is something that we provide them in the crypto market too. Also, we enable them to learn about crypto through our education and mentorship and help them get started with crypto quicker. The mass market for this is massive. There are 500,000 financial advisors in Europe and 85% of them are not yet in crypto. We go after small to medium financial advisory houses in Europe which are either already in crypto or they are looking to enter. And we acquire them through a mix of cold and warm approach and so far we managed to close several large players. Uh, there are no strong competitors in Europe. The only serious one is CoinHouse. In the US, there are more established players, and two of them got acquired last year. We make money from different types of fees, and we share them with financial advisors. That is something that they don't have on other crypto platforms, and that is one of the reasons why they are so keen to onboard with us. We launched a mobile app in July last year and raised 250K cash. Um, but in the meantime, we realized that there is a great untapped potential in the financial advisory niche. So we pivoted and launched the financial advisor portal in December last year. We also secured a 120,000 euro grant. Uh, and mid of this year, we're planning to launch a SaaS project, uh, which is uh, where we will offer our investment strategies via API to other crypto brokers. Our goal is every quarter to onboard a certain number of advisory houses and SaaS clients and towards end of the year to do a bigger seed round where we will acquire the necessary licenses to get into tokenization. This uh, business model is quite low cost because we don't have marketing costs. We partner with financial advisors which already have an existing client base and they're just bringing their clients to our platform. Uh, this business is also quite uh, profitable. We project around 70 million euros uh, in revenue in the next five years. Uh, we have quite an experienced team. I worked five years in banking and last, last six years in crypto. I led business development at two large crypto brokers, uh, Unicorn Bitpanda and at Cryptomat. My co-founder Marco we used to work for launch companies such as Sony, but also at multiple startups where as a CTO he scaled tech teams from zero to 30 people. So far we managed to achieve uh, 10 million euros in assets under management in terms of traction and in March we had uh, revenue 18,000 euros. We expect the revenue in the coming months during the bull market to be significantly higher, mainly driven by the performance fees. We're raising 150 to 200,000 euros via convertible loan or a safe agreement with a token warrant. The funds will be used to uh, build up additional attraction to hire uh, salespeople and developers. And we just managed to close 100,000 euros from DSI Group of Angels. And we are here today uh, to find additional investors who are willing to support us on our journey to become the number one digital asset platform for financial advisors in Europe. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned at one point that this is you're going to target financial advisors. Exactly. And it's kind of a word of mouth, therefore you don't need marketing. So how does that work? Telepathically or? Not, not too much marketing. Currently okay. we're doing direct sales, so, so the, we, we're not doing any advertising. We might in the future do some lead magnets, some PDFs, some whatever educational things and, and attract them that way, but so far we're doing direct sales. Okay, so you have a financial advisor who's financing, like, how do they do that in traditional finance? Now you need to do the same for the financial advisors in crypto? Be 
basically traditional, so financial advisors currently have an existing client base. Uh, average advisor has 200 clients. And for them, they manage you know, their portfolio in stocks, in bonds, in whatever, and they want to put 5% or 10% in crypto. So they don't have a platform where they can see all their clients. Now they need to go on different platforms, uh, create accounts for their clients, log in, log out uh, every time, construct a so, portfolio for each, and then rebalance every month, so thousands of that's transactions. That's what I'm saying. So you need to educate the financial advisors in crypto first, exactly. and then push, push, uh, not push, incentivize them to... Yes, that's what I said, yeah. That, that's what I meant, sorry. That's what I meant. How do you plan to do that? I mean, financial advisors, especially traditional ones, are boomers like hell. They only accept like very, very sound investments. So yeah. how do you do that? So uh, there are two ways. One, through our own education. In the past, we were doing some webinars, but not for, for advisors, but actually for end clients. Now, when we switched uh, to the advisory model, we were just doing sales, no, no education. Uh, some which said that they are not yet ready. We were sending them our webinars, our uh, PDFs and, and things to get started. Uh, we are now contemplating two things. Uh, one is running our own course for financial advisors. We already prepared all the materials. Uh, the other option is partnering with a company which has education for uh, ad advisors. It's called Certified Digital Asset Advisor, something like that. So we're thinking maybe it's even easier if we partner with them, they do the education, we recommend to each other uh, advisors and so on. Okay. Sure. We have uh, currently uh, around 15 people, uh, only three, four which are full-time, everyone else is contractors. That's what uh, saved us through the bear market and we managed to you know, uh, survive this and, and thrive. Uh, we have uh, my co-founder and, and me, uh, Marco, uh, who is the CTO, I'm the CEO. Uh, we have a team of multiple uh, back-end, front-end developers, mobile developers, uh, DevOps, uh, we have a designer, uh, we have a, a crypto researcher uh, who is also doing customer support. Uh, we got uh, one junior salesperson, we got a product uh, person. Uh, we have uh, uh, now hiring uh, uh, another sales. No, no. We we already have a cup. We 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 just we just got 100k. Uh, plus we have a uh, uh, 120k in <coughs> sorry in, uh, from the grant. We also got some revenue. Plus yeah, plus. Yeah, yeah. It's not MRR part is uh, MRR part is uh, whatever, but uh, <laughs> no, there there are some. Okay, long story, uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, ah, yeah, but yeah. Size? Well, that's tricky because uh, now a couple of VCs want to invest and they want to write us larger tickets, so so it's a little bit flexible. We know what to do if we get additional funding. Uh, okay. We can. How much did you raise before? We raised in the past 250 and uh, then got a grant 120 and now raised around 100. And what is your valuation? So far, everything we raised, uh, we raised uh, with a 10 million cap and uh, plus token warrant. And you mentioned before some pre-made portfolios. So are yes, you constructing those portfolios? They so, okay. I started masters in quantitative finance and I was constructing portfolios in the stock market, but I didn't have time to sit and code and stuff. I went to my professor from the university. He's been developing uh, for the stock market strategies for the last 25 years. So with his team of uh, five PhDs, develop, they developed as a service uh, those strategies for us. But with our inputs and also we back I will have to cut you, sorry. Ah, okay. sorry.